Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. Hey, what's up, everyone, and thank you for checking out Social Jello with Angelo. Quick housekeeping、uh, if you're listening to this as a podcast, subscribe to the channel, it'd be much appreciated. If you are on YouTube, well, you're already here. Today, I interview this is part of the Kaju Kimbo series. I'm interviewing Michael Dana. He is a, he's got a Kaju Kimbo background as far as the styles that he mentioned. So check him out. It's a really good interview.、Uh, he's got a really unique perspective and he, he will get into it. I think, this is, I think you'll enjoy it. All right, check it out. Hey, what's up, everyone? How you all doing today?、Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm here with Michael Dana,、uh, a Kaju Kembo instructor? Yes. Okay, cool. A Kaju Kembo instructor coming out of、uh, North Carolina? Yep, Durham, North Carolina. Nice. All right,、yeah. cool. What's up, man? Wait, man. <laughs> welcome, on, welcome to the show. Glad, glad to be here, man. Glad you're having me. I'm glad you agreed to do the, the FaceTime thing because、um, I really wanted to see your reactions, you know, and、uh, I really wanted you to see me, and more importantly, I wanted me to see me. So I got a little screen here. <laughs> This is like me popping up so I can wash my hands moving all over everywhere because that's what I do. I talk with my hands. <laughs> and for some of you that are watching, uh, I, uh, uh, Michael Dean also has his own YouTube channel, so I do encourage you to check it out. I'm going to Put some sort of something somewhere around here at this point. Yeah. And、um, real quick,、uh, I guess,、uh, how did you get started? Aside from YouTube,、uh, how, did you, how did you get started? What, what started you on your martial arts journey? So that's. I started, I don't know exactly when I started. That was a while ago, and I knew I've been on and off and on. With martial arts for a long time. And then I moved to Chapel Hill, right next to Durham, North Carolina. And about three or four months after that, I got diagnosed with cancer. And so, and so it, it was kind of a, that's why I'm wearing this, my breast cancer awareness time, man. And I, I try to make that known to everybody、um, because cancer is a big thing. But I had the cancer, and it wasn't until about 13 months after I was diagnosed, I actually started what I call formal training, where it's like, hey, we're going up through the ranks and everything like that. And so I did it for two reasons the same two reasons that almost everybody does martial arts, and that was for the fitness aspect and the self defense aspect. Because at the time, I worked at a bar in Franklin Street, which is like the downtown of Chapel Hill, which is really nothing. <laughs> But it's let, me, let me, if I can. If I can interject real quick. Yes.、Yeah. How old were you when this happened? 24. All right. Yeah, I, I was in, in middle of college. And so the, I had a brain cancer, which is the type of cancer I had normally is for kids. But、um, I was older, and so that made it really rare. We're talking like one in a million kind of rare. And so. What was also really rare about it is that it is typically a fast growing tumor. I had mine for like a decade before it got big enough to where it's like stuff didn't work correctly. And so、um, then I went and got diagnosed and got two surgeries and a bunch of radiation therapy. And so I'm fully aware that there's a very good chance that my head does not work like everyone else's. <laughs> so I have a tendency to. Look at things completely differently because of that. I have a much different perspective. Like I said, about 13 months after I was diagnosed, is when I started doing martial arts, and it was what I call、um, extreme physical therapy, right? Because it took me about six months after I started to actually be able to physically do a jumping jack, right? So there was no way I was going to be able to run away from somebody if something happened, and I was in a Job essentially where that could happen, right? And so there was that aspect. There's also, like I said,、um, just being able to, I'll use the phone, let's just say this, just this, 
that took me about a year after the six months after I got uh, was able to do a jumping jack. I mean, a lot of people take simple stuff like this for advantage. Um, I was about to pick up my coffee cup, but I'm like, it's got coffee flavored water in it, so I don't want to. I don't want to risk it. I like it too much. <laughs> so you were you were 24 when you started doing martial arts. Is that the formally? Yeah, I was formally. probably. Okay. Probably like 19 or so, 19 or 18 when I started doing stuff on, off, on and off. I was in a form of martial arts called Pimenta Walk, which is a, a stick form. I did that a lot before I came here. Is and that, the reason why... Is, hmm? that, is that kind of like a screma? Or? Yeah. So a, a screma, Cali, Arnis, they're all different dialects of the same language. All right. and so um, Pimenta Walk, the difference between it and Dulce Perez is basically... The founder of Polenta Walk didn't like some of the guys in Dulce Perry, so he went across the street, started his own close range martial art, and named it after the street Polenta Walk. And then, for any so, of my listeners or, or people watching on YouTube, uh, who are probably, if you're not follow, if you're not up to par on martial arts, we're talking about Filipino stick fighting. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh yeah, the, the, the names, man. Like being a mixed martial artist, I got so many of them. You can, you can have several things. Like I, I say it all the time: the human body can only move in so many ways, and so you can have a lot of the same name or a lot of different names for the same technique. And so it's just like I said: Cali, Screamo, Arnis, all different dialects for the same language. Um, and so that's how I started. Went to walk. Went to walk. And then kind of morphed into modern armies which is in a lot of a lot of martial arts a lot of kempo um a lot of kaji kempo even the branch that i was in which is one hop kendo is a branch of the kaji kempo i was in that has a mixture of modern armies and dulce paris because c is the guy who did um one hop kendo he trained with koi uh, Kennedy, I think is, is I'm, I'm totally, I could totally be mispronouncing that man. Uh, I'm, bad, like, I'm bad with names too. Don't, no, no worries. Oh, not, not just, just <laughs> words in general, man. I'm from the South, but it's just like, I got the one language. I can't spell half of it. I can't pronunciate the other half. And so I already had a disadvantage and I've had brain cancer. So it's like, whatever, man, I just put the, put the words out there in any which way I can. So. <laughs> well, English is my second language, so like I have the same issue. <laughs> um, so you were 24 when you started formally. You know, you said you did some some uh, some Filipino stick fighting to, for the general term for people that don't know. And then when you turned 24, you got diagnosed with brain cancer. You started doing formal martial arts training. What was that in? What was what what style was that formal martial arts training in? That was in the one hump kendo branch of Kaiji Kempo. Okay. And the reason why I stayed with that is that when I got into it, I found out that it was the same martial art that Mark Cascos does. And I was a big fan of Mark Cascos because I don't know, like, you haven't, in case you're wondering, I'm a huge film nut. I love film. I love just all things. Like, you know, if I drop a pop culture reference, you know, that's why. And so... I knew Mark Costco's before that. When I found out this was his martial art, I was like, dude, I'm sold. And it was founded by his dad. I was like, I'm totally there. And his dad actually was the um, main fight choreographer in Ninja Turtles 3. He doesn't, they don't credit him, but they credit the guy who got his, uh, I guess, like studio or his organization to do it. And if you look at the martial arts in that film, you're like, oh, yeah, that's. That's Sifu on a heartbeat. And so, like, when I had him on my podcast, that was literally the first thing I asked him. Everybody else is like, fighting career of this, whatever. I'm like, freaking Ninja Turtles 3. <laughs> I was like, let me, let me ask you about, this is what's important to me. Tell me about the turtles, man, and the weapons work. It was beautiful. If you watch that movie, that's like the best martial arts out of all three of those things. And if you also look at the who was credited as a fight choreographer, I forgot his name, I'm blanking on his name, but he's responsible for the fights in almost every film that came out from the 80s and 90s. And so um, he's a really talented guy, but as clear as day, you're like, okay, this guy did not do that. Uh, so um, 
for me, fighting styles are like fingerprints. You get to know them well enough, and you can start to see them in different places. And so uh, I can definitely see, okay, this is this has got Sifu out touching everything. Um, that's a really bad way to put things down. I say it, but anyways, and then there's this guy. So, so you started your formal training. Um, you were you were really into pop culture and, and film, and from there you you were working at a bar. You said you you mentioned real quickly you were working at a bar. You were working as a bartender, a security. What were you doing there? A little bit of everything, okay. everything but being the. Well, I think. No, I think uh, one night I was like the bouncer, which was really like we were that shorthanded that night. Uh, you have this 140 pound dude who's like 5'9 and just nothing. Like I turned sideways, I disappear. I'm super skinny, man. Um, and they were like, "You're you're gonna be our bouncer." I'm like, "All right, now okay." And so, so but yeah, once you started, when. I guess the question I sent you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it up. They're gonna see it on the screen. But you, did you notice uh, a difference between Kaju Kembo and other styles? Like, because you you came from a kind of a mixed background, like you mentioned before. What were some of the differences you noticed from the other stuff you did? So I didn't notice any difference initially because I wasn't really focused on it. Um, initially, it was like focusing on the fact that I'm trying to get one side to work with the other side because um, what I had because of the cancer was what's called a sensory motor feedback gap. It's a neuromuscular disorder. Well, basically my brain says talk to my right side at the same um, rate that it talks to my left side. So it's a, a mixed match, which is why I talk with my hands all the time. Um, because if I do certain things, you don't really see it. If I do other things, it's painfully obvious. And I worked really hard on that. And so that wasn't my focus. Later on, though, when I really started to analyze the different things because it's funny you have the psychology degree i have a economics degree and so like i was analyzing the and my viewpoint economics is like the mathematics behind personal choice right and so like i'm looking at this and i'm analyzing the different techniques because as i said before you can have a lot of the same things with just different names and so i was trying to really fine tune get these things figured out for my people so I can better teach them in the context. Um, and so when I did that, I started seeing all the different things that were similar and different as far as what one hop kendo in my branch is for difference between Kajikipo and some of the other martial arts. And so there are a few things, but then there's a lot of stuff that's like, you know, a, a jab is a jab is a jab. <laughs> <laughs> so those things are going to be the same. Um, and so the, the main difference between, well, Kaji Kipo, most martial arts is just the level of contact because most of the standard martial arts don't have that contact. So you have, uh, that's a big thing for them as far as like they train. They're always like almost pressure testing everything. And then they have the multiple opponents. A lot of martial arts don't even bother with that. Right, and that's like the main staple of just Kaji Kenpo, and that really relates to the background of having been found it in Hawaii. And I mean, the plot of something from what I've been told was basically like the ghetto of Hawaii, where it wasn't a matter of if you'll get in a fight, it was a matter of when you'll get in a fight, so you have to learn to defend yourself. Like, because I mean, I tell people all the time, depending on where you go, you can go your entire life without ever getting in a physical altercation, you know. Or if you want to get a physical education, there are places you can go that is like almost indefinite. And that was one of the places. And so that was kind of how Kanji Kempo formed because that was the reality and they needed to be able to answer those questions. Um, that's how I look at different martial arts is that you have martial arts that are what I call how, and then you have martial arts that are um, the hypothetical what ifs. The how martial arts are typically one martial art where and they have, like, everybody does it in the same way. Like, uh, Stephen Kesson talking about how the sport generally fuels the martial art is because those are how martial arts. It's like everybody does this the same way, the same way you have to do this because it fits into this little box. Now, the what if martial arts are typically the mixed martial arts. Like, the more mixed martial art is, the more 
uh, questions that can answer essentially. If you think of a technique as an answer to a question, then it's like, okay, what if this person has this or asks this question that my martial art doesn't have an answer to? So I find out the answer, maybe these guys have an answer, I'm going to pull from them, right? And so they had all these different questions, and they're like, okay, these different things can answer all these different questions, just pull from that, pull from that, pull from that, and then you come up with this thing that, where you get to ask a question that they don't know the answer to, which is also a huge thing. You can't accurately defend against something if you don't know what that something is. You know, everything you can do in every situation and everything your opponent can do in every situation, winning is a result. That's me paraphrasing our rule. So but it becomes the same knowledge. It's like, hey, I want to win whatever fight it is on my own terms. I'm going to pull as many different answers to a same question as I can to have more options because maybe one won't work. I got like five more that will. So um, that was Kajakempo. And one Hopkin variant of that was just more Chinese Kung Fu, like Sifu added more of the Kung Fu forms, he added more of the weapons. There's a whole lot of weapons work in one Hopkin though, and he kind of, I think he got that from the Tracy Kempo system, that's where he learned it, just really putting two and two together. Um, and he also added some more circular movements, so the Kanji Kempo is a little bit more linear, whereas some of what I do in Kung Fu base is more circular, and it, it, just, it makes sense with what he added. So those would be the most notable differences. Other than that, man, it's freaking all the same, and as you well know, and I've seen some of your other stuff, is that uh, a lot of people, they have their own way of doing everything. You know, like I said, just different names for the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so. I, mean, I, I think one, one uh, I'm a really big... Uh, fan of Bruce Lee's philosophies and one of the things he mentioned was unless someone can grow an extra two arms or an extra two legs essentially you're always going to have this point where you're going to have grappling or striking right and I'm paraphrasing here but there's not yeah. there really isn't going to be a new style because you're always going to either have striking or you're going to have grappling and everybody has the same tools to work with so at one point you're going to have a lap over in techniques if that's what you're focused in yeah, yeah. My next question for you, brother, is when did you know you wanted to get your black belt? So that one actually goes back to the very first belt test that I had. And it was the black belt test. I was going for my yellow, and some guy was going for his black, and C file was there. And so actually, if you um, if you watch my Dragon Theory video, the intro of it, there's two pictures. There's one of me with Sifu when I was very young and I actually had curly hair. And I can take off my hat. My hair is straight. Um, it's just that was right after I would have been diagnosed. And so, like, with the radiation therapy, your hair falls out. And it basically kills follicles. When it grows back, and they don't tell you this, it grows back different. And so it grew back for me extremely curly. I'm like, I've never had curly hair. Well, except for like, I guess when I was a kid, my mom was like, you had curly hair when you were three. I'm like, whatever. So it came back and had like these, I, I call them Jew curls, not to be like, whatever. But like, <laughs> it's so, it's just like. It's crazy, curly hair. And so I put that image there. And right next to it is a, an image from a, the event that we did last year where I met him again. I've met Sifa a couple of times. And so I was like, I want to have these pictures side by side. But when I first met Sifa, wow, his biggest thing was he would say to people that, you know, you're not a yellow belt, you're not a blue belt, or whatever like that. You're a black belt in training. And so I was like, all right. Cool, man. And so that's kind of what set up. I was like, you know, I'm always gonna, always gonna go this. This is just these are like speed bumps on the road to getting to that point, you know. And so that was my thing, and that was 2010, I think, maybe 2009. I'm not really sure. I should have had like the dates. I mean, you sent me the questions, and I, I uh. read them up. Were cool. I thought about them, but I should have like. That's no worries. I have the same problems when it comes to dates too. So it's no. 
as, well, yeah, as long as when, as long as you know the as long as you know what happened and you can tell the story, that's that's all that matters to me. I can try. <laughs> like, it, luckily, we're talking about stuff that happened after my brain cancer because stuff that happened before is what's that? I came amnesia, and I'm like, ah, eh, 20 years of my life is gone. So, like, like let's not focus on history because that I don't have. But, you know, let's focus on here and now. Or we'll talk about some of the history that I know as far as the different martial arts and, you know, as far as teaching and running a business and how it's all similar but totally different. And, I mean, you're right there with you. But I feel like we are very much kindred spirits and doing the exact same things. You're just on the other side of the planet, you know, <laughs> which is probably a good thing because then we'd be competing with each other, right? <laughs> well, not, not even that. Like I said, for Kaju Kembo, for me, it's just one big ohana. So even if, if we were in the yeah. same area, I have another – there's only one other practitioner that does Kaju Kembo in Japan. He's in Okayama. Really? And me and him have connected, and we're just trying to – trying to. we're ohana, right? So we're always doing cross seminars, and I'm, I'm always looking to – I don't know how other people do it, but the way I do it is if when I was in San Diego, me and my instructor would meet up with all the other Kaju Kimbo schools in the area. We'd always make sure to get together for barbecues. And even though we come from different schools um, right. and we essentially have different techniques, we'd still make it a point to get together for uh, black belt meetings and invite all our students and to train together and to just – that's Hawaiian style Ohana. That's just how it's supposed to be. So that's that's how that's how I was – that's how I was brought into it. So like, yeah, that's, that, it's really nice to have, to connect with people that, that come from the same thing, you know? <laughs> I totally relate to that because like on my end in North Carolina, we're the biggest, my school is the biggest one half kendo school on the East Coast. Not the biggest Kaiji Kempo school. There's a couple other Kaiji Kempo schools in even the state, but like as far as specifically one half kendo, I'm it, man. And so I, I do enjoy finding other people in the Kanji Kempo family, right? And, and you're picking their brain and being like, hey, what's similar to me? There's, there's a Tumpai guy in, uh, he's like an hour from me, but I, my my instructor, um, Professor Carter, he's in High Point, which is another hour in the other direction. And his whole thing is he's trying to bring people together. He's a eighth degree in and uh one half kendo and kaji kenbo and kenbo and he's got a he's got a resume to say phone book man if people you know listeners phone books are what old people use before <laughs> google kind of you know. um and so i he he wants to try to bring people together because he's got, actually got ranks and everything i think when you get to a certain point like I said, everything is similar. You just have to learn names. So you just learn what is different from art, art to art, and then you start. You can pick it up a whole lot quicker once you just learn those little differences. That's why some of these old martial art guys just kind of pick up black belts like the Pokemon man. They're just like gotta get them all kind of deal because <laughs> inherently understand. Oh, this move is the same as this other move. This seems this other move. All right, it's just a different context, a different name. I have. Um, I have what I call the three C's and name of things, man, which is going to be either culture or context or copyright because there are, in the last hundred years, there are people who totally changed things simply because they didn't want to get sued by the other person they didn't like. Um, they'll never advertise that stuff because it's not glamorous, but it's totally true, totally legit. Like, oh, yeah, we just changed the name so that this guy wouldn't know that we were doing his thing, right? Um, and that happens all the time, and it's frustrating as all get out. It really is. Especially when, like, me and my sensei, oh, backtrack, I got three black belts. And so when I refer to different um, um, masters and, and, and senseis and everything, that's because I've got multiple people that I'm under. But I was talking with him early on, and we would spend like 10 minutes talking about a technique. And then one of us would demonstrate it, and then we'd realize, oh, we just wasted 10 minutes talking about something that was the same thing. Um, it, <laughs> it's just that kind of level of frustration. <laughs> of, it is just like, oh, man, you can just call it this thing. I call it this thing. You have the actual Japanese terms for this stuff. I don't. I barely have the English terms. <laughs> well, that, that, that happens in jiu-jitsu too, right? Right now with Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I'm in Japan. So you have Brazilian jiu-jitsu and you have Japanese jiu-jitsu. They're both jiu-jitsu, 
um, with the difference of how they introduce the names of the moves. Even even now, like I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu under the Gracie Baja school, and, but it's being taught by a Japanese instructor. So obviously, everything's being told to me in Japanese. Since, since he's right. Japanese, he's going to grab all the moves and teach them with the judo terms. He's not going to say Americana. He's not going to say armbar. He's not going to say yeah. Kimura. So like sometimes he'll be showing me something in the middle of showing me something. He'll be like, Angelo san, <laughs> how do you say this? How do they say this in America? And I'm like, that's an Americana. He's like, oh, okay. And he turns around to everybody like, in America, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, they call it an Americana. So he's like, he's like breaking it down. So it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's the same thing. So for you, man, it's really different, right? You came in, you essentially came in with a traumatic brain injury, right? Like if I really had, if to relate this to people that didn't have a brain tumor, plenty of people that have done martial arts long enough have brain trauma. I know I do. So like, so like. <laughs> for people to relate to what I had, because what I had was very rare, but the tumor I had was on the same part of your brain, the alcohol effects. So if you've ever been really drunk, that's what I, that's the same effects that I had for like four months. All right. So like I was mentioning earlier, you are coming from a very unique uh, background here. A lot of people that start martial arts don't, you know, like you said, you had a very rare condition. So on top of that, getting into martial arts from there, what was your black belt test like? How'd that go? Well, I've had several actually and so a lot of my a lot of my experiences with that are going to be different from a lot of other people i had one where it's like a really long arduous deal where it's a lot of heavy sparring and um and it's just it was just, just knock down drag out thing for like eight hours and then i've got had another one actually i've had two um where it was demonstrate the forms that I have just in one Hopkindo, right? Because um, I got like 35 forms that I know. I mean, just a crap ton of forms. And so I'm one of the few people that can, that I know of, that can do like 12 of my forms in a row, back to back without stopping and just kind of changing which direction I'm looking so that I don't have to reset on my mat. I've only got a, uh, 1500 square foot at space and so some of my forms they move around different directions and so it's like I have to know which directions to go to or so um, did that I did you know I had like my Kenpo Jetsu test was that was interesting like I, that was a very cool learning experience because that was very similar to what we did in class and I wasn't expecting that that was the last one I had and I was kind of like we get done with like one thing of like I was ready to go again. You know, I was like, wait, wait, that's it. When I'm sparring, I was, you know, I came back from the Kanye Kimbo backgrounds. It's like, I'm, I'm used to like fighting everybody in the room kind of deal, you know? And I'm, I think you had that as well. Right. And so it's like, come kind of, yeah. So like fight everyone in the room. Um, and then when you're done, we're going to, yeah, gonna then, hit you. Then, you, then you have to I, fight everyone at the same time. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, the, the, now, you had the, did you have the, um, oh, I don't know what you would call it, but for us, it's like the congratulatory conga line where it's like you shake their hand and you tense up and they deck you there in a, in yeah, a we, we, uh, they, they would, uh, some, some of the, some of the black belts either kicked or punched us in the stomach and then we shook hands later so they 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 beat us up <laughs> and then after beating us up then later we, we did the kaja kembo hug and after we bought out everything yeah. but yes yeah, same same similar yeah, yeah. same thing <laughs> my, my uh, professor carter um he kicked me and he i'm like i'm i'm glad he pulled the kick because he's like a foot taller than i am and he, he's he's just a big dude he's a nice dude and he has a kind of muay thai background and he did a back leg front kick, but it wasn't a thrust. Like he hit me and came back, but it, like it, 145 pounds, dude. It sent me back like six feet, and I lifted off the ground. And I was I was happy I landed it in the horse stance and maintained the balance. Otherwise, it, was just, <laughs> it would have really looked bad. Um, but dude, I had like a like a 
little bruise outline of his foot midsection for about two or three days. <laughs> if it would have showed up on camera, I would have taken a picture of it, but I don't have it. So, but yeah, I totally right there. Um, for those listening, that is going to happen everywhere. It's just something that does happen. <laughs> so, after you got your black belt, um, I don't know if it's after or during or how that happened, but what kind of what kind of competitions did you participate in? I know that you did come in with a unique condition. Did that make you hesitant to compete? What were some of the things that, that you did get into? That kind of makes me like not capable of competing. Like anything sanctioned by the athletic commission here would just medically be like, nope. And I technically have a a hole about this size a little smaller in the back of my head where they remove the bone to kind of get up to my brain oh. and the thing is they didn't actually put anything in place of that they're just covered it with muscles so most people have like one muscle in the back of their neck i got two um it's just weird and like if you if i get it if i get my hair cut really short you can see the scars like straight down the back mm. um and <laughs> my surgeon, my surgeon, they were like, "Hey, man, we're, we didn't put anything metal plate, nothing like that." And I was like, "Well, that just means there's muscle, and then brain so I can brain." I was like, "Isn't that bad?" He's like, "Trust me, if you get hit hard enough back there, that's the least of yours." I'm like, "All right, good point, but still." And so medically, they kind of made a whole lot of competition like um, not a viable thing. But because of the school laws, that like I said, we did a lot of did a lot of sparring and that's kind of what I call an in-house competition. There are a lot of people that I know love the idea of fighting, not even professionally, just amateurs, just getting into cage or whatever like that or competing. But because they get it on a weekly basis, they just, they don't do it. When you push them, they're like, I'm, I'm, they come up with any kind of excuse in mankind not to actually take that step, which is really unfortunate. Um, but that's the case of a lot of people in my school since, uh, since they had that, not just every week, but like almost every other day, depending on how many classes they went to, how many classes they could physically do, um, they got that all the time. And, and just epic, epic matches. Like, um, I think I had one that lasted 20 minutes nonstop. It was awesome. It was a whole lot of fun. Um, but it was, it was, it was just this long, Rock them and sock them to every different range you can possibly think of. And we were just kind of equally matched at that point where none of us, neither one of us got like the upper hand. And it just kept going until like class was over. <laughs> so, <laughs> think, and again, just to kind of clear up with my, uh, with my listeners and anyway, like, you know, Michael's coming from a very unique circumstance with his condition and he couldn't, he couldn't compete. He wanted to compete. He couldn't. But luckily, because of the way Kaju Kembo works, we don't we never turn anyone away for any reason. So like, if you want if you want us if you want to brawl if you want to scrap, we're gonna let you scrap. And that's just how we work. So that's, that's really cool. You got a you got a place and you got a venue to be able to to get to get that in there. Even though you know yeah. it wasn't in a in a comp in a competition setting. You still got to get yeah. in there. You got to scrap. You got to brawl. You got to do what you wanted to do, and get that experience, which is really, yeah. which is really awesome. So, That's really awesome. I didn't get medals for kicking people's butts, <laughs> but I did. So, <laughs> I don't really do that as much now because I teach, and that kind of looks bad and retention as far as like. Oh yeah, be beating up your students is never good. This <laughs> is <laughs> <laughs> not really a good idea. No, no, no. Where it's a very late people award, like I'm gonna do this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's why. Um, yeah, I I, I got you. That's why, like, when my and my, I always have my students always ask me why, why do you train in different places? Like, why don't you? If we already have history training here, why do you always go like to? to the MMA club in Kobe and why do you go here? I'm like, well, cause I can beat them up. <laughs> I don't have to worry. Those are my, those are my sparring partners. They're not my students. So I, I need, I still need sparring partners. <laughs> yeah, I many of my students are like, Hey, 
I'm going to teach you how to wreck somebody. Just don't wreck anybody here. Go to some other schools, wreck them. They're not paying me. Because <laughs> yeah. at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, I still got to pay the rent, man. And so I can't, I can't mess with you guys injuring each other. Go injure those guys. <laughs> um, and a few of my people have taken me up on that and with hilarious results. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I... I Totally, <laughs> I get it. I get it. It's just a different. It's a different viewpoint, you know, a different way of looking at things. If you're just a student, if you're just doing whatever like that, but like when you have your own school, it's kind of like, hey, I know. It's, for me, especially, I don't have any contracts, so it's like if somebody gets injured, they're gone. Um, yeah, so I'm always have to stay on my A game, and I really kind of like that. But at the same time, because of you know contracts and the fact that I've got classes every single day and I've got a rate the pay per month based on how often you come each week. So if you only come one day, I got a rate for that. Um, and that allows a huge amount of flexibility. All right. Because so of, just, just to clarify. So when you say you no know contracts, you still have your liability waiver. You're talking about contracts for payment. Like for payment. Payment. Yes. Yeah, I, that's a very Kaji Campbell thing to do, man. My, my, my instructor was the same way. Um, I'm the same way. My instructor, my my instructor only started not he he. I remember he told me when he at one point we had to move to a rec center because the facility that he was teaching at he had to move and it was in a transition leave period. And during that time, he apologized to me that I was going to have to be on a semi contract through the community center. He's like, I'm really sorry. It's I have no choice. It's a community center, and they're asking me to to lock people in for three months or whatever. And I'm really sorry well, about that. But again, like. That's a very Kajikimbo thing to do, like let people train. I, I'm the same way. I have I have my monthly fee and then I have my, my walk in fee. And as long as you sign the waiver, right. you can train. I don't care. So like this. Yeah. But like it's it's because of that though, I do have a, a large community of some of the poor schedules in mankind. You know, I've got a, a lot of doctors, nurses, postdocs, people like who pretty much will, like, I, I have a bachelor's degree, but I feel like I'm the dumb one half the time. They say stuff, I'm just, like, it's, it's way up there. Um, those kind of people, they're always coming here because of that type of flexibility. So that's what draws them here. But it is a, I mean, I I wish I had a button I could just press and be like, okay, 10 people in this class, 10 people. I never actually know who's going to show up because of that variation. If they miss Monday, maybe they'll come on Tuesday or whatever like that. And so um, they're consistent in that they just come to a class, um, but not necessarily the same class because I do have a wide variety of classes. Um, I forgot what we were talking about. Oh, I'm, no. I'm getting, oh, no, worries, no worries, no worries. We're actually almost to the – we're almost almost to the to one of the final questions I had for you actually. Um, so, you come from a multiple different background. Uh, I'm I'm. It sounds like you've trained and coached different types of fighters, right? MMA fighters, um, people that just your average nurse who wants to come in for a self defense class. Um, what are your thoughts on forms, point sparring, and full contact fighting like MMA. Right. So um, it's a matter of knowing the context and really how best to use them. In a sporting situation, it's like you either win or you learn, right? You don't really lose unless you don't play the game. And that can relate a lot to stuff in life, not all things. Like I'm not called a cancer victor. I'm called a survivor, man, because it has to do with choice. You choose to impart on that thing, that's a winner learn situation. If it just happens to you, then like an act of God kind of thing, then that's a totally different matter. But it's really kind of the, the mindset of doing that. For me, looking at forms from a teaching perspective, I freaking love forms. I mean, I, I do have the Kung Fu background, but I'm also in uh, Kempo Jesu. Here's a, here's a total mind bender for you. Kempo Jesu, is uh, Kenpo, but it's also Jujitsu, right? And my instructor uses the Japanese words and because he has a Judo background, right? And he uses the Okinawan forms. So, horribly messed up there, man. So, like most Kenpos have like the swift sword and whatever, like that kind of thing. They have like 300 some odd techniques. And oh, by the way, we have some forms. And I came from a background of like that was all mixed. 
mixed in. And I realized that a form basically is just a way to practice the moves. And so your forms, your katas, are essentially just longer versions of like your sequences and sets and drills because they're also in Kung Fu, they have two person drill, uh, forms. And so it's the difference there is the length and the understanding because when you do a drill, it's like, oh, I'm doing maybe one or two things, I'm working with somebody, so we both kind of know what's going on, but we're still doing set movements in a set order practicing those movements within the situation which will be sparring. So when you think about in that context, then it's like, oh, all these different forms are just ways of practicing the techniques that you would use in the situation. So I went through probably three, four years ago, it was a while now, where I went through what I had and I matched up all the different techniques of all the different forms that I've taught. Because I was like, you know, I'm tired of teaching the same thing over and over again. So now it is a case where it's like, okay, you learn a form and you learn like a third of what I teach because I teach the uh, forms in weapons and grappling. So the same sub to make it more efficient. That's kind of what the common kind of student would make things simple and efficient, right? And so I took my forms and I, I did that and I'm like, okay, after you learn this thing, here's the application of that. Here's how we do this, here's what we're at. And that's where the sparring comes into play. Sparring is really, really, and I can't stress this enough, so good at teaching a person what they need to know. It's really terrible at teaching them how to do it though. Um, and this is coming from a person who did a lot of sparring, right? I loved it, it was fun, but I didn't learn as much as I could have if I had just focused on the individual things that were in the situation. And then when I get to the situation, I'm much better at it. It's what it's like um, what I call teaching the calculator. Back when I was in uh, school a long time ago, um, they would teach a lot of theory, but not necessarily the calculator. And when I got into college, it was the same thing. I had uh, three statistics courses, and the first two they taught like 90% theory and 10% application of like this software they had used. And then I got another, my last class and two was like, okay, 50, 50, first semester solved by theory, here's a hundred numbers, you find all the different statistics based on that. And then the second half of the semester, he's like, okay, here's software, here's 10,000 numbers, and you're gonna use that software in these codes to figure out this stuff and it's more practical. At that point, I was like, I love statistics. Before, I was like, I hate statistics. And now I'm just saying, like, because he did two things. He did a software called Stata, and then he did a software called um, Excel, which is what everybody uses. And that's like, I've got these just absolutely insane statistical databases of, um, in Excel of all kinds of stuff, like my gas mileage, the amount that I've taught, the people that I've taught. Because for me as an instructor, if like, say I have 10 people, and after a test, I do the like, oh, all of them are really slow. Okay, that's something I should focus on. That's not them. That's something for me. It's like, okay, let me make sure make it so the next time they're super fast, you know, and that's the kind of thing. So I have all these databases with that. Um, but like I said, sparring is really good and not used as well as I think it should be, man, because there have been times where it's an easy lesson plan where I'm like, I've got a bunch of students and they're on the mat and I'm kind of like, well, I wanted to go over this one thing, but they're really good at that. So I'm like, okay, for your warm up, renew a, a light spar. And then I observe and I say, okay, everybody's got this one thing that they're not doing. That's my lesson plan. And you're warmed up. And so it's one of those things where it's like, okay, they didn't know this thing. Now they do. I'm going to focus on that. And then we'll go back and circle and put that like that extra tool in the toolbox, essentially. So, again, I look at everything differently, and um, that's one of those things. Like, I'm not, not against that at all. I'm, I'm for a whole lot of it. I just want to get everybody at least decent at some of the things that are used within the situation that they're working so they get the best out of it. Because at the end of the day, I want to teach people to wreck people. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I... Uh... If I understand correctly, 
you like to use a little bit of everything to be able to teach people to apply themselves and you and you uh, in whatever setting oh, as well I, as whatever i got man cool yeah now i try to learn as many different ways to do the same thing as possible because a situation can change just by a little bit you might have somebody who's a foot taller than you and so you need to have something that a smaller person can do to a bigger person even if it's not something that you would do because like what works for you may not work for me what works for both of us may not work for this person and so as an instructor even if we're not going to do it we kind of need to have that because that might be their you know their go-to that might be the thing that saves their life in a self-defense application or if they do a sporting application that's the thing they win with and we want them to win we want that w you know i was going to make a hand sign but i was like nope <laughs> <laughs> this is so not a w at all <laughs> My, uh, <laughs> my, uh, I guess my final question to you, and I ask this to all my the people I interview, is, uh, and for you, I'm going to change it a little bit because you, you're coming from a very unique background. I'm very what, unique. What uh, I'm my person you'll ever meet. What would you recommend to someone who's getting into martial arts that might be hesitant? Because they're coming f somewhere from a similar position as you. They're coming with an injury. They're coming with a. They're coming in with something that the doctors and the whole and society is telling them that they should not be getting into fighting. Like oh, yeah. you, you, have, the risk of death is very high. You shouldn't do it. No. Right. And then, but you still want to do it. So, like, what kind of? And I've never asked this question before because I, I want to get your insight. I, I'm sure there's people listening that might be wanting to get into it, it might be in a similar situation they're scared to because they've been told they can't. What what do you yeah. what advice do you have for them as far as what kind of style to choose or what kind of martial art or what kind of, what, what they should be good looking at? Well the, the thing to remember is that the medical practice is still a practice and that the things they're doing nowadays is not the things that they did a hundred years ago. And so it's funny you mention that because I did have to ask my oncologist if I can even do martial arts in general, I didn't even say what kind. I was like, can I do martial arts? And his quote, and I freaking love it stuff because he's a very practical real dude. And he was like, yeah, you can do it. You'll get your ass kicked, but you can totally do it. <laughs> Not wrong. You know, you know, I, I, was, I was a very small person who couldn't really move. And one side didn't work very well. I just got my butt handed to me, but I still learned. And so... The thing is, is that my school, because of that, because I see it as um, um, extreme physical therapy, and I see the benefits for it, I've got what I call the school of broken people. Everybody has something. Now, I've got three students who have been hit by cars as a pedestrian. Um, and so, yeah, it's crazy. And the thing is, like, I understand where they're at and what to do with them. So I always modify things to fit them the best. And that's one of the reasons why I love mixed martial arts is because I, I can do that. I'm not a how martial art. I'm not, you know, here's how you do it. I'm a what if. What if this person has this thing where they can't do this thing? All right, well, I'm going to have to have something for them. Um, when, one of the things that people don't realize is that for probably centuries before there was ever a fitness industry, there was martial arts. That was one of the reasons why forms were originally created. And that's one, like the main, the top two reasons why anybody ever gets into any martial arts can be self-defense or fitness. And so when you have a person who is in my situation, then that's going to be huge for them as far as relearning and reinventing the neural pathways and stuff to make things work correctly again. Um, like I said, I probably am the most unique person to be, not just for this diagnosis that I had, the fact that I was able to recover at the rate that I did, and it's really attributed to martial arts. Now, as far as any style that would do that, I always recommend whatever style you enjoy because it's a process, it's a lifestyle. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna do martial arts and then one day retire. In fact, uh, Lama, who I talked about earlier, he has a great saying. He's like, martial artists don't retire; they just die. All right, and I'm like, dude, you're you're 78. You shouldn't be saying that. He's like, no, no, it's a lifestyle, and so that's the thing is that you lose. Know, it's the yin and yang. It's like, hey, we know how to fight, we know how to do it, but we have this other aspect that's not just healing other people, which is what I think some people get wrong. Um, it is healing yourself because that's the it too. It's like I can hurt them, 
or I can shield me and I see, and I see in the yang. So I can, I can do both myself. And so you can totally use that, but it has to be something that you enjoy. And don't, don't worry about ranks. They're just your representation, uh, representation of your knowledge within that school. The likelihood that you know the same thing as somebody else in some other school, even if it's the same system, is totally not going to be there. Um, I mean, we're in the same system, and there's a good chance that even though I recognize a lot of your stuff, we do things differently. Everybody does things differently, and it's okay. So they have to, I would say, find something that they enjoy and know their box, know the context in which that thing is used for, because everything was made for a reason, right? Knowing that reason is the best way to get the, the best out of it, to then apply it. This is you know what it's used for and what it's good at, and then apply it. That's like, it really pains me when people who did nothing but like one martial art are downing another martial art that they've never done. I'm like, of course, like Taekwondo wouldn't work in a judo match because it's not made for that. But if you were to flip it, if a black belt judo tries to win in a Taekwondo situation, he's going to get kicked. But if you Back around, Taekwondo guy does judo, he's going to get thrown. You know, they're both really good for what they have. Once you understand that, take what works for you in your situation and then apply it to that, and you'll be much better for it. I do recommend that people find places that aren't heavy on working the situation and more about the technique because that's where injuries can happen, and that you can see that in like weightlifting. You know, if a person tries to do a whole bunch of weight without the proper technique first, yeah, they'll literally get there. It'll be harder for them, and they could potentially injure themselves doing it. And so it's a matter of just finding a place that stresses that technique. Doing the sparring is a good thing. Make sure you know what you're doing first, right? Because the person who gets the most out of that situation is the person that knows the most or is bigger and smarter. Because <laughs> you can muscle your way through just about anything. Um, but you want to be able to, I guess, use your entire body. I like to use everything that I have um, because I'm, <laughs> I do that a lot, man. I'm a, I can, I can talk for days. That's what I'm good at, man. That's why I make a YouTube channel so I can just talk all the time. I mean, I've got a, I got a website that has uh, the dragon method.com. I've got 24 hours of video tutorials on there so oh, I did which can talk which like actually that. brings me before my wrap up because part of my wrap up yeah. and we've already started I'm gonna I'm not editing what you just said about talking and your, <laughs> and your website uh what where can people find you man what do you what where, if people want to get more information from uh I know you said a YouTube channel what what where can they find you what what links do you got all right so the YouTube channel is tkfmma Right, and so it's going to be YouTube slash TKF MMA, and that's going to be the case for a lot of things. Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram, they're all going to be slash TKF MMA. The site I was just talking about is called thedragonmethod.com, and that's going to have video tutorials for just a whole bunch of stuff. I'm adding to that all the time. In fact, I've got five videos that I need to add to it another video I need to upload and then like five more videos that are, are still on the camera. I haven't even like edited them yet. I'm like just lots of stuff. I'm doing as much as I can without having partners. So like Bob has been my partner. You know what I'm talking about Century Bob. He's like always there. I'm like, this is Bob. This is, you know, this is what he's made for. Um, but that's the dragon method.com. That covers not just techniques from all the different things that I know, but it covers like, uh, teaching martial arts and then I've got some fun stuff like I got all my podcasts on there and um, I've got another fun segment called Kung Facts so there's just a lot of stuff like I said I kind of this is like uh, the social thing for me basically it's like this is my outlet you know everybody they get to do the martial arts I'm like I, I want to talk I want to make stuff I want to make videos and if I'm just talking to a camera fine <laughs> so I like talking to a person because right, I get that instant feedback, but it's just like a, a little lens. I'm like, all right, I can make it. So you heard it here. Um, I know uh, I always mention this. Uh, this is also a podcast and a YouTube channel. For those of you listening to the podcast, uh, TKF MMA, uh, I encourage you to check out his, the YouTube channel, Google it, uh, subscribe to, their, to his YouTube, uh, to the YouTube people. 
uh, TKF MMA. And uh, Michael, uh, I really appreciate you coming out. And um, for my listeners, stay tuned for the wrap up. And that's a wrap, everyone. I really appreciate you checking out Social Jello with Angelo, the SGWA podcast for short conversations with a back fist probably should have said that first i'll always say that last tagline i'm really bad at this stuff either way um if you haven't already subscribe to my show i really appreciate it i'm working on the kaju Kembo series i also do stuff about psychology and some other topics as well as uh, i have a video series that i'm always working on for my students sharing martial arts videos, martial arts instructional videos, that kind of stuff. If you're an instructional, if you're an instructional, <laughs> if you're an instructor and uh, you want to get a different perspective on different kinds of stuff, I recently just put up something about how to teach martial arts lessons on Zoom considering everything that's happening. And that's about it. Uh, shameless plug, I made a new YouTube channel. I mentioned it during the show a little bit. It's a comedy channel. It's called, it's under... LOL Lounge is the name of the channel, and the show is called Los Chingones. So if you want to check that out, I will have a little something here. All right, everybody, y'all have a great week, great month, and I'll catch you all next month. Peace.